morning. It's good to see you this morning on this Super Bowl Sunday. And so uh, I don't know if we have any Super Bowl fans in here today, but uh, maybe a few. Uh, well, I had an orange jacket on uh, this morning in honor of the Broncos and our Kentucky boys. But it's good to see you in worship this morning. Um, a few announcements we have before we get started. I want to thank those who are serving today. Um, Brenda Gardner and Hannah, of course, week after week are right here with us. Deb Kaur is our liturgist today. Um, Beth and is Robin here today? No, Robin's not here today. Her dad is sick. Uh, so uh, Beth's our diaconate. Dana is in the booth as well as uh, Brandy uh, recording services. So we want to thank all of those who continue to serve for us. This week we will not have a uh, ensemble rehearsal on Wednesday. Hannah is going to be busy, I think, in Cincinnati. Uh, Louisville, actually. Louisville. So we wish you well there, and uh, proud of Hannah and all that she's doing with that. And uh, it's a great honor for her, and we are happy to have her do that. So we will not have ensemble rehearsal this Wednesday. Today after worship, we will continue our series, If the Church Were Christian, Rediscovering the Values of Jesus, and invite all who can to stay and chat for a bit about that. It's an interesting discussion, and I hope you'll join us. We will continue to have nursery and children's church sign-ups. I have given, um, Brenda's going to be coordinating the nursery rotation. Anna Gill's going to be coordinating children's church. I've given them the list of folks who have signed up for that. If you did not sign up, please see one of them after church or contact them sometime um, and let them know that you're willing to be on that rotation. We hope to begin that very, very soon. On Sunday, February the 16th, during worship, it will be a special time that's two weeks from today. We will have the um, ordination and installation of our new elders and also the installation of our new church council. So for those who are present, who are members of those particular groups, uh, put that on your calendars and I'll be in touch with you more about that in the coming weeks. Also on that same Sunday, after we do the installation uh, of those folks, we will pack backpacks. So uh, put that on your calendar as well. There's so much things, there's so many things that happen behind the scenes that I wanted to share with you as a congregation because sometimes if you're here just on Sunday, you're unaware, but wow, there's so much going on in our church. Uh, the elders met for the first time this past Tuesday and it was a really good meeting for us to discuss the spiritual needs of our congregation and how to make sure that we are tending and caring for the flock. And so that was a, a great meeting. The trustees met yesterday to discuss the building and grounds and how to keep those maintained. The council has already had a full day retreat and will meet again on February the 11th. The elders will meet again the following day on the 12th. There is a new website in the works complete with deadlines that Brandy has given me uh, for writing. And um, we hope to have that up and going by March 1st and it will be fabulous and will help us so much with our communication, with our outreach, with our uh, keeping in touch with one another. There's a new Facebook page that happened just this week that Brandy created, and I encourage you to invite your friends to like that page. Again, it's a, a way that we will be able to reach out in our community. And then uh, Mary Ann, who is not here with us today but is working behind the scenes, sent me this week five new advertisements that we can use. They're ready to go that we can send for various publications with our Still Speaking Common, so many things, that identifies us with the United Church of Christ and also clearly lets folks know who we are and where they can locate us. So can we just give thanks for all that's happening behind the scenes for our church? And now let us give thanks for one another, for we have come here today out of a rainy Sunday in a crazy world to get grounded, to find fellowship with one another. May we begin doing so by greeting one another this morning.
Please rise as you're able for our opening hymn this morning, number 436 in your New Century Hymnal, God of Grace and God of Glory.
please be seated. This morning, as we prepare to pray together as a church family, I invite you to share joys and concerns with us, and I'll start out with a few that I'm aware of. First, we want to continue to pray for Karen Miles as she recovers from surgery and uh, for her uh, medical treatments and things that uh, are in her future. We want to pray for Karen and for Mary Ann as she cares for her. Also, we want to pray for Clancy McClanahan. Clancy hasn't been with us for a few Sundays. She had congestive heart failure and the VA hospital was dismissed uh, and was back in the hospital uh, yesterday morning with the infection. So she has, uh, we've been, I've been in contact with her and she requests that we continue to pray for her uh, having some difficult days uh, and we want to pray for Clancy. A couple of celebrations that I would like to share with the church family. First, uh, I mentioned briefly last week that my mentor and friend uh, Don Peters from um, First Congregational Church of San Jose, California, uh, and how she treated me in 2008, and today she and her partner Bailey will be married after worship in San Jose, California, and I was unable to go. I'm sure she will see the service. So, Don and Bailey, congratulations and best wishes from me and from Bluegrass United Church of Christ. And also, I have somewhere in my pocket, I had technology problems all morning this morning. Uh, I was hoping to share this with you uh, in bigger form, but I will share it the best that I can. But the fantastic news is that these two precious little ones are now the newest members of Bluegrass United Church of Christ, Isabel and Spencer Cribs, born to Shannon and Sarah. They are all doing fine. Isabel had a little lung problem and was the, in the Neo ICU unit. But thanks be to God, all four of them went home day before yesterday. And so I believe, if I'm right, these are the first babies born while their parents were attending. Were you, was Cedar? Was Cedar was already here, right? Yeah. In a carrier, uh, we were talking. Brenda and I were talking about that earlier. But I believe these are the first two babies born uh, into the congregation, and they are so appreciative of our prayers and our thoughts. And uh, it was an amazing uh, time. You know, uh, as a pastor, you have these tensions. You visit with folks who are very sick and facing difficulty. But certainly, what a joy it was to go in and see that little Spencer, and then go to the ICU and give a blessing to Isabel uh, and wish her well and health in getting home. And we are thankful that they're home. And I know you are like me and cannot wait to get them in your arms. Are there other joys and concerns that you have uh, that you would like to share? Yeah, Sherry. There's my great aunt who's 98. Ninety-eight. Pam. It's good to have you back, and we're so thankful your mom's doing better. Cindy. Saw another hand somewhere. And I have a joy. Uh, my baby sister is, uh, I don't want to say her age today, but it's her birthday today. Uh, <laughs> and my mother had uh, both cataract surgery on both eyes and was doing well. Great. Great. What's your sister's name? Laura. Laura, okay. Seth. It is a joy to see my mama back here today. If I can get her cooking again, we're in business. <laughs> Brandy. Her name? Justin. Thanks be to that. And the beat goes on. Sherry. He is in the hospital. That's 
uh, infection in his pancreas and some other issues, so we want to remember uh, Robin's dad. Thank you for uh, reminding me of that. Harris? It, uh, it being Groundhog Day, <laughs> I don't think any of us would be upset with an early end. <laughs> yeah, with the forecast tonight of two to five inches. We will. Kenny, did I see your hand up? Yes, Kenny. As we will. Thank you for reminding us for that. Yeah, Michelle. Tough stretch, very tough stretch. We will pray for her. What, what a privilege and how much at home it feels for us to be in this safe place where we can lift up our joys and concerns. Let us prepare our hearts for prayer. Gracious and loving God, who gives us presence and power, oh how thankful we are to come to you as your beloved children, each one of us created by you uniquely. How we give thanks for your welcoming, inclusive love and grace. Oh, in our world, oh God, the, the joys and concerns that we share together, that tension and living between celebration and tear, realizing that most days we're somewhere in between. We have lifted up to you, oh God, and to our fellow church members, our concerns for those who are so dear to us, our friends, our family, our brothers and sisters in this congregation who are facing medical diagnoses and treatments and journeys. So we ask, O oh God, for all those that we have mentioned, that you give them your comfort and your hope for healing, May your presence be known to them in a special and unique way. God, we thank you for the celebrations that we enjoy together and with our loved ones. Especially today, we celebrate the birth of Spencer and Isabel and their good health. And we are so thankful that they are home with their mom, Shannon, and Sarah. We pray that you be with this precious family in the days ahead as they adjust to a world in a new way. 
for other celebrations that we have lifted up to you, for the gift of life to those we love and birthdays, for celebrations of weddings and commitments, for celebrations in process as they are of those governments who are choosing to give all people their civil rights. We give you thanks for those on the ground who are doing the work to create equality. And we pray, O oh God, for our leaders. May they be ever mindful of the decisions that they make. May they continue to be aware of the gaps that are increasing between the haves and the have-nots, the no's and the no-nots, and those in power and those who sit on the sidelines with seemingly no hope. So help our leaders and help us continue to do whatever we can to close those gaps so that all of us can walk hand in hand and live in a world of your vision, of peace and hope, of love and inclusion for all of your children. We are so thankful for this community of faith at Bluegrass United Church of Christ. So much is happening in the life of this young congregation. And so as we have meetings and develop processes, as we seek to reach out to our community, keep us mindful of who we are, of what our basic DNA is, of what is most important. And oh God, give us your vision, a vision that is different from the world's. And may we re remember as we prepare to reflect on the prophet Micah and the Gospel of Matthew, that you call us to be a different people. And different is good when it brings about change in the world and in our lives. Move us just now to open our hearts and our minds to be the change we wish to be. Amen. Our first reading today is from the prophet Micah, chapter 6. Hear what the Lord is saying. Arise, lay out the lawsuit before the mountains. Let the hills hear your voice. Hear, mountains, the lawsuit of the Lord. Hear, eternal foundations of the earth. The Lord has a lawsuit against his people. 
With Israel he will argue. My people, what did I ever do to you? How have I wearied you? Answer me. I brought you up out of the land of Egypt. I redeemed you from the house of slavery. I sent Moses and Aaron and Miriam before you. My people remember what Moab's king Balak had planned and how Balaam, Baor's son, answered him. Remember everything from Shittim to Gigal that you might learn to recognize the righteous acts of the Lord. With what shall I approach the Lord and bow down before God on high? Should I come before him with entirely burned offerings, with year old calves? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams and many torrents of oil? Should I give my oldest child for my crimes, the fruit of my body for the sins of my spirit? He has told you, human ones, what is good and what the Lord requires of you, to do justice, to embrace faithful love, and walk humbly with your God. The second reading is from the Gospel according to Matthew chapter 5. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up into the mountains. He sat down, and his disciples came to him. They taught him, saying, Happy are people who are hopeless, because the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Happy are people who grieve, because they will be made glad. Happy are people who are humble, because they will inherit the earth. Happy are people who are hungry and thirsty for righteousness, because they will be fed until they are full. Happy are people who show mercy, because they will receive mercy. Happy are people who have pure hearts, because they will see God. Happy are people who make peace, because they will be called God's children. Happy are people whose lives are harassed because they are righteous, because the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Happy are you when people insult you and harass you and speak all kinds of bad and false things about you, all because of me. Be full of joy and be glad, because you have a great reward in heaven. In the same way, people harass the prophets who came before you.
Thank you so much, Hannah, for your direction, Brenda, for your accompaniment, and Ensemble for your dedication and commitment and use of your gifts. So if you are in church for the first time ever this morning, or for the first time in a long time, you are in a great position today. For you have joined many of us who are regular attendees and some of us who have attended church all our life at our elders meeting this past Tuesday night. Reverend Herm Heisey, retired Methodist minister, yes, our Herm, recalled that he had been in church since his mom swaddled him as a baby and laid him on a table while she taught Sunday school. He told me, I've been at this church thing for a long time. Those of us who join Herm with a long history of this church thing, have heard the two scripture passages that Deb read over and over again. Our challenge then is to join with you first-timers in hearing it fresh and new and to imagine ourselves listening with the audience to whom it was given to thousands of years ago. Our reading from Micah is perhaps one of the most well-known quoted scriptures in the First Testament, it's one of my personal favorites. For the last verse of Micah 1.8 really sums up the gospel message, I think. We can make living in covenant with God and with one another so complicated, riddled with creeds and doctrines and right beliefs, becoming gatekeepers of sorts when we don't own the gate. But the prophet Micah reminds us a simple yet very challenging recipe for living out God's vision to do justice, to love kindness, to walk humbly with your God. Friends, it's simple. But oh my, it requires an intentional journey and it is a journey that is very different from our culture. Now, when Micah gave this prophecy, the, the Hebrew people were continuing to find their way. They had been on a roller coaster journey with their commitment to God, sometimes unwavering, and other times selling out quickly to the highest bidder of all that called them away from God and one another. So Micah was offering a theological interpretation of the dizzying events near the end of the 8th century when political, cultural, and religious wars were dominating their world. Micah was quick to call out those who claim religious practice unaccompanied by ethical performance. Micah's message was different. It was to be counter-cultural, to be different from a boxed-in way of living to overcome in the face of danger and oppression, Micah attempted to change the lens of the ancient community and give them a path that was inclusive of action. Do justice. Care of one another. Love kindness. And being gracious and forgiving. Walk humbly with our God. To Micah, being different was a good thing. So some 800 years later came another prophet with a similar be different message. And again, many of us have heard this familiar story over and over again. It's another one of my favorites. In Matthew's Gospel, we pick up from last week when we reflected on Jesus calling his first disciples, two sets of brothers, Simon Peter, Andrew, James, and John, called away from their familiar lives of fishing and into lives of uncharted waters and alien visions, fishing for people. Matthew provides just a few verses of Jesus' initial ministry. He's traveled through Galilee, teaching in the synagogues and curing every disease and every illness. That must have been quite the sight to see. So much so that it had people abuzz. What's going on? Something different is happening in our world. This teaching rabbi is changing 
who we are. People are being healed and transformed before our very eyes. So all over the Middle East, people were seeking Jesus out. And it is here that our New Testament passage for today begins. Crowds swarming around Jesus everywhere he went. People desperate for hope and healing. But instead of holding a mass healing revival that would draw more people and be televised for all to see, Jesus retreats to a mountain. Something he does at critical points in his life. He sees the crowds and goes up a mountain and sits down. He sits down and begins to teach his disciples and us if we will let him what has come to be known to us as the Beatitudes. There are many contemporary readings of the Beatitudes. One of them written by Catherine Hawker was our call to worship this morning. Happy are we. Here's another called Who's Laughing by Rob Lacey. I'll tell you who laughed last, the people who don't think too much of themselves, who know they're a mess. Their ticket to heaven's already in the mail, first class. Who will be happy? The people who know about grief, who don't shove it behind a sofa but face it. God's going to put an arm around them. Who will be content? The modest, gentle types who don't go around grabbing. They'll get given the world. Who will be laughing? The people who only want to do the right thing, like it's their food and drink. The good news inbox for them will be piled high. Who will be laughing? The people who don't hold grudges, who forgive and let live, they'll get treated likewise. Who's laughing deep down already? The people who aren't polluted with the stuff that co-ops the heart, they'll get to see God. Who's laughing deep down? The people who stop fights and start friendships. Who turn fists into high fives. They'll be known as God's children. Who's laughing? The people that get slapped down for doing the right thing. They'll stroll through the gates to a whole new world. Jesus sat down on the mountain. And began to teach the disciples. Kids, will you join me? So in the Bible this morning, we're talking about Jesus teaching his disciples. And those were folks who had decided to follow him around and try to be kind and nice to people and to teach them a different way to live. Because in the world way back then, people were selfish, and they talked about one another, and they weren't very nice to each other, especially if someone was different. And sometimes in our world, it's like that, isn't it? So Jesus was teaching them to do things a new way. Now this morning, I watched you all walk into church. Did you all know that? I watched you walk into church. Hi, Cedar. And we walked in going front ways, right? I want to try something. Come with me. This way. Come on, Cedar. So we're going to go back here like we walked into church. So we were coming in this morning. Turn around. You all walked in front ways, right? Just straight ahead, right? There's this guy, his name is Pete Seeger, and we're going to sing a few of his songs today or hear him. And he wrote a lot of cool songs about people being different, the world being different, doing things different. And one song he wrote was called Turn, Turn, Turn. So what I want us to do is turn. Can we turn around? And we're going to turn, and we're going to walk backwards. All right? Here we go. Ready? 
The songs are went like this. To every season, turn, turn, turn. There is a season, turn, turn, turn. And a time for everything under the heavens. Now turn. Stay, right? Turn. This way. Turn that way. So we walked in this way, backwards. Something different. Now I'm not saying that we walk in backwards every day. But what Jesus teaches us is to do things different in our life. To be willing to step out and do things that create change. So let's ask for God's help as we do that. Let's pray. You all pray with me, okay? Dear God, help us be kind and be nice, especially to those kids who are different. Give us courage to live your way. Amen. Thank you. Some of you may be familiar with Pete Seeger a folk songwriter and singer whose music peppers across our culture and calls for social justice as related to racism, war, the environment, workers' rights, and other social ills. Pete Seeger marched to a different beat than most. Maybe when he went to his Unitarian church, he walked in backwards, I don't know. But he lived in a different way, and his difference was good. A prolific songwriter and singer, his best-known songs include Where Have All the Flowers Gone, If I Had a Hammer, Turn, 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 which are lyrics adapted from Ecclesiastes. These songs have been recorded by many artists both in and outside the folk revival movement and are sung throughout the world. He was one of the folk singers most responsible for popularizing the spiritual we sang together two weeks ago, We Shall Overcome. It was he who changed the lyric from the traditional We Will Overcome to the more singable We Shall Overcome. He died this week in his late 90s. Still active, his grandchildren said, right up until his death. On hearing of his passing, President Obama said, and I quote, Over the years, Pete used his voice and his hammer to strike blows for workers' rights and civil rights, world peace, and environmental conservation. And he always invited us to sing along. If I had a hammer for reminding us where we come from and showing us where we need to go, we will always be grateful to Pete Seeger. This morning, with an idea sprung from Deb Corr and blossomed by Brenda Gardner, we featured a lot of Pete Seeger's music. Confession. Where's Brenda? Deb is there. I had no clue who he was. <laughs> I have sung many of these songs my entire life. And yet the person who penned them was unknown to me. Pete Seeger was not on my radar. His lyrics and tunes rolled off my lips, but he lived somewhere between the cracks of the words and notes. The people Jesus was ministering and those he chose to carry on his message lived between the of society. They were not the society A-liners or cultural well-to-do's. They were not the political powerhouses or the highest priests. They were common folks. We are called to look between the cracks for God's presence. 
It is there we will find the deepest longings of our hearts and souls and resist defining ourselves according to the expectations or level renderings of the world. Be attitude living is different. It is an intentional journey and one that doesn't come easy. Be attitude living is countercultural for the first are last and the last are first. This was a familiar and ongoing message in all of our scripture. On that mountain, Jesus was telling his disciples, See all those people follow me? Those who are sick, diseased, pushed to the side, ignored. See those who are humble and meek. Look over there to the ones who are grieving. And over there, the ones who are standing up for the oppressed and calling for justice. See those over there who are willing to live righteously. And you, all of you, who are called different because of the radical ways in which you're following my lead, you are who are persecuted or laughed at, you who are now lonely and worried because you have left comfortable fishing for the unknown. Jesus said, blessed are you, happy are you, all of you. Here's another reflection I really like on the Beatitudes. Nancy Hastings Hestead former pastor of Prescott Memorial Baptist Church in Memphis, Tennessee, had this reflection on the Beatitudes some years back. While we say our prayers with every head bowed and every eye closed, Jesus is on the hillside with his eyes wide open to the blessings before him. While we beseech God for blessings, praying God bless our church, God bless our sick, God bless America, Jesus identifies the ones who are already receiving God's blessing. The favored of God are those who are the unfavorable ones. The mourners, the meek, the poor in spirit, the persecuted. She continues, When we start looking for signs of folk being in the church, the Beatitudes give us some clues for where to begin the search. Forget looking at our church programs, our good deeds, our goals, our numbers, and how we're managing it all. The Beatitudes tell us, look between the cracks. Look in places where life is falling apart. Maybe there, perhaps there, is the only place we get a glimpse of the reign of God breaking in. Prophet Micah gave a different message to encourage the beaten down Hebrew people and to keep their focus on what was important. Pete Seeger, Catherine Hopper, Rob Lacey, Nancy Hastings, Sehested did the same in their own way. And Jesus climbed to the top of that mountain where he had a wide angle view of all the people and all their needs and all their diversity and their difference. And when describing these folks to his disciples, who may have thought with the rest of the ancient community that they were nothing more than low-hanging fruit on the tree of despair and losers, Jesus tells first time here, then and now, and those of us who have done this church thing a long time, look, look between the cracks to find the authentic presence of God. For God is found in places and situations that we least expect. Brothers and sisters, this morning, we are called to be radically different. Radically different in how we live and how we are church and in who we are. Blessed are the different. For different is good. Dare we be. gather around this table every week with all of our differences, asking God to reveal God's presence in a 
way that we can feel and live out. This is God's table where all are welcome. Let us prepare our hearts and minds to have that time of special God, as we gather at this table, we ask for your blessings. We ask that you reveal your presence to each one of us as only you can. So push away anything that distracts us from our communion with you and from one another in these moments. Bless this cup and this bread to nourish us for the journey to encourage us to be different and to prepare us for doing so. As we look to the example of Jesus in his living, we remember the prayer he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. On the night when Jesus would be betrayed, some of those same folks that were on the mountain with him that day were in that room with him that night. It had been a long journey to that point. And so Jesus, as he was eating with them, knowing that he would be betrayed later and that his life was coming to a close, he took a loaf of bread and he blessed it. He gave thanks. Then he gave it to his disciples. And said, take and eat. This is my life that I'm giving for you. And then after supper, he took a cup. He said, this cup is a sign of a new covenant that I'm making with you. It is a sign that I will always be with you. So we are reminded this morning, no matter who you are, where you are on life's journey, God's presence is always with us. Whether this is your first time in church or whether you've been doing this church thing a long time, all are invited. You're invited to take a piece of bread as is, is, is passed to you. And then after a time of meditation, to take the cup.
Let us pray for a morning offering. God, we come to you just as we are. Just as the disciples did on that day on the mountain. Just asking, O oh God, that you reveal to us the people who are around us and what their needs are. May we look upon your world with opportunity for how we can reach with love and hope and peace your people, our people, our brothers and sisters. So however we give this morning with our resources, our time, our talents, our gifts, however we come, however we give, we ask and we know that you will use our offerings to bring your vision to our world. Amen. Well, you knew the communion song. Let's hope you know the offertory. One of the great things that happened this week was I had lunch with the longtime friend Bernice Coleman, who had been wanting to see our new church for years. Bernice is somewhere around 90. Recently lost her sister Lucille, and so we had lunch and came to church and spent time with Brenda Gardner unplanned. She was practicing the organ. Then we went to the Cracker Barrel and had lunch, and she said, I want to do something for your church. What can I do? And I talked to her about our organ and our fund, and she said, I want to give a gift. And so she gave me a very, very generous gift towards our organ. The CD that Brenda had given me to listen to during that time included, it was a singer CD, and it included How Can I Keep From Singing. As I put that CD in, Bernice began to sing. Looking Between the Cracks. We will sing this morning as we prepare to leave together. My life flows on in endless song. How can I keep from singing? Blessed are they 
And if God may be leading you to respond in some way, I invite you to do that. And if God may be leading you to join our church, I would love to meet you at the front. Let us sing together. As we leave this place, we are among the meek, the mild, the downtrodden. Hear the voice of Jesus. Blessed are you. Happy are you. May you find peace and love on your journey. Amen.